Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the ninth online talk sponsored by Roundtree Tryon Galleries. Uh, again, I'd like to acknowledge the support and thank him for the support we've received from Jamie Roundtree of Roundtree Tryon Galleries. It's with that support that we're able to put on these series of talks for free and to reach a wider audience beyond our own membership. Welcome to everybody. And can I take this opportunity to encourage any non-members to join us as we continue to promote all aspects of sporting art. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Joe Meacock uh, from the Glasgow Museums. Her talk is entitled Glasgow Boy Artist, Joseph Crawhall, a beautiful natural horseman and our champion jockey. Welcome, Joe. Joe is responsible for British painting, sculpture, prints and drawings from 1600 to 1960 in Glasgow Museum's collection. Her specialist areas of interest lie in pre-Raphaelitism and aestheticism, Scottish 19th and 20th century art, women artists, war art, and religious iconography. Uh, and given all those interests, we're delighted that she'd been able to add Joseph Crawhall uh, to those interests. She was formerly the Scottish Regional Manager for the Public Catalogue Foundation and also worked as Data Editing Manager for the National Inventory Research Project, Research Associate for James McNeil Whistler, The Etchings, A Catalogue Resume, and Editor of Mapping and Practice and Profession of Sculpture in Britain and Ireland, 1851 to 1951. Uh, as Sally said, she's been very involved in developing the displays for the soon to reopen, reopen on March the 29th, of the newly refurbished Burrell collection and is working on an exhibition of pre-Raphaelites in Scotland. She's produced a number of publications across a number of subjects. Of particular interest is a forthcoming book introducing jo Joseph Crawhall as part of the new Burrell introducing series, something for us to uh, look forward to and I think coming out later in the year. So with that introduction, welcome, Joe. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Tim, for that really kind welcome. Can you all hear me OK? Yeah. So um, Glasgow boy artist Joseph Crawhall. Um, so Joseph Crawhall was born um, in 1861 and he died in 1913. If we can go to the next slide, that's good. Thank you. And he's known for his carefully observed and elegantly drawn watercolour studies of animals and birds. Um, his artworks are notable for their economy of line, bold colour and decorative design, as seen in this work here, The Flower Shop, um, in which you can see a woman pausing with her horse and carriage outside a florist with its colourful display of bouquets. Um, and the red shaft of the carriage creates a striking contrast against the black flanks of the horse, which is elegantly posed in near profile. Next slide, please. Crawhall's best artwork features horses, whether disciplined performance animals, um, like the circus pony in this one, or thoroughbreds with pent up pre-race nerves, or calm cross-country cross hunters or stumpy work ponies, which you can see in the next slide, um, which is of fish, the fishmonger's pony. Um, and I have to say this is one of my favourite, even though the, the pony looks rather sorry for itself, it's such a beautiful um, and decorative um, pastel. Um, well, chalk, sorry, chalk study. Um, he also um, drew prim carriage horses, fiery barbed stallions, um, Toreador geldings um, and protective mares with their foals, as in the next slide, um, which shows a newborn horse, just a quick sketch. Now, some are quick sketches and some more finished compositions, but both show Crawhall studying and observing the individual traits and idiosyncrasies of animals, describing their distinctive gaits and stances, telling a story through a mere hang of a lip, or a flick of the tail or flex of a hind leg. Next slide. 
In the mid-1890s, Crawhall and his family lived for a short time in Bayswater in West London. And from there, they visited the annual September Barnet Fair. There was a livestock sale and a fun fair with stalls and amusements. And in the back of this painting, um, you can see travellers, caravans and sideshows, including boxers and a fat lady, all staple elements of Victorian fairground. However, these are marginalised. The real attraction for Crawhall was the horse market. In the foreground, you can see pairs of horses as they quietly wend their way past the viewer, us and Crawhall, um, and down the slope. Um, Crawhall noting individual posture and gait as they pass. Next slide. Now Crawhall's agility in drawing came from familiarity. He was born in Morpeth, Northumberland, and his father, also jo Joseph Crawhall, was a prosperous rope maker and amateur artist. And his family were keen sports people, and Crawhall grew up on horseback. His contemporaries commented on his slightly bandy legs, a result of riding from too young an age. And he would joke that Providence would have bestowed four legs on man had he intended him to go afoot. Wherever he lived, um, whether in Newcastle, Tangier, London, Hertfordshire or Yorkshire, Crawhall Road took part in local hunts and attended horse fairs and race meets. Next slide, please. Probably the greatest influence on Crawhall was his father. Um, although Joseph Crawhall Sr. wasn't much of a horseman, he was more into fishing, um, he was inspired by early um, chat books, publications and treatises in his antiquarian library to publish his own illustrated books, many of them angling publications, um, the most well known of which is the completest angling book the air was writ, um, brought out in 1881. Um, and horses and hunting do feature in his um, published um, um, chat books and border tales, which as I said, he wrote and illustrated and published himself. Um, and as you can see from this particular woodcut illustration here, um, they were purposefully um, antiquarian in style, made to look naive and older than they were. Now, as a young man, Crawhall Jr. contributed several illustrations to his father's books, most notably to the completest angling book, The Air Was Writ, and also to Old Friends with New Faces. Um, next slide which came out in 1883. And this illustration here um, is from that publication, Old Friends with New Faces. And it demonstrates Crawhall's rapidly maturing skills as an artist. He's age only 22 at this point. And you can see that in terms of the drama, the coloration, the design and animal characterization of this illustration. Encouraged by his father, he drew from memory giving his works a dynamic quality as he wasn't enslaved to detail and could focus on the key defining characteristics of his subject. And this is a practice that he carried on throughout his entire career. Fellow Glasgow boy John Lavery wrote, he practically never drew from nature and never used a sketchbook, but he would spend days or weeks observing and no essential detail or colour was ever missed. He seemed to take a mental photograph of everything he wanted to know and could develop and paint it at any time afterwards. Next slide, please. However, despite Crawhall's um, natural ability, his father saw that he was in need of technical training and encouraged him to go to art school, recommending that he study in Antwerp, although in the end Crawhall only enrolled briefly in the Paris studio of Amy Moreau for a few months in 1882. And this chalk drawing um, of, of a horse-drawn cab um, faced, uh, viewed face on may date from Crawhall's time in Paris. And you can see that it combines skillful foreshortening, elision and capturing of movement with a Parisian elegance. Hooves, knees, harness, blinkers and lamps define horse and carriage with parallel shading suggesting speed all rendered with tremendous economy of line. Next slide, please. But it was very different to the kind of animal painting being taught by Moreau. This is one of Moreau's history paintings depicting a cavalry charge in the Franco-Prussian War. Although, to give Moreau credit, 
he was one of the first artists who attempted um, a more correct depiction of horses in movement, horses galloping. Um, he's it's still not quite right, but previous to this, horses tended to be depicted in kind of hobby horse fashion. I'm sure you've seen them. I've got an example later where their legs are outstretched both front and back. Next slide, please. Crawhall led the way in a new kind of animal depiction rooted in the careful observation of the world around him and the poetic distillation of character. His watercolours and drawings skillfully convey movement and individuality with quick, elegant lines, visual wit, and a decorative concern for colour and design. And this work here, the circus rider, you can see that golden light falls on horse and rider, suggesting wonder and awe at the equestrian acrobatics that thrilled Crawhall from childhood. He recalled that he used to play truant from school whenever the circus was in town. And you can see that with its neck gracefully arched and its hooves pointed. Um, the horse here moves around the circus ring um, at a collected trot, and we can only imagine to enthusiastic applause, possibly between um, equestrian feats. Next slide, please. Crawhall is often associated with the Glasgow Boys, a group of young painters with whom he worked and exhibited in the 1880s and 1890s. And this is um, a portrait of Crawhall by Glasgow boy E.A. Walton. Um, next slide. And here's an example of some of the different kinds of works that the Glasgow Boys were producing. The Glasgow Boys were challenging the art establishment in Scotland at the time with their loose tonal paintings of ordinary everyday life influenced by the French naturalist Jules Bastien Lepage, the subtle tonalities of the Dutch Hague School, and the colour harmonies of American artist and aesthete James McNeil Whistler, not to mention the decorative flatness and unusual compositional angles of Japanese prints. And Crawhall shared many of their influences and aesthetic concerns. Um, next slide, please. He met the group in the late 1870s through his sister Judith, who married the elder brother of E.A. Walton. He joined the St Mungo Art Society in Glasgow, which was a sketching club where Walton and James Guthrie and George Henry were already members. And they went on sketching trips together um, from the summer of 1879 onwards to Rossneath at Gerloch, Rigoturk in the Trossachs, Crowland in Lincolnshire, and Coburn's Path in the Scottish Borders, where this particular photograph was taken. And like the Glasgow boys, Crawhall um, sought to immerse himself in ordinary rural life, following here um, the example of Bastien Lepage in, in France. Next slide, please. In this particular work, The Farmer's Boy, um, you can see Crawhall following the tenets of the Glasgow Boys, purposefully choosing an unheroic subject, a farm boy on a workhorse, wearily returning from a day in the fields, and playfully focusing on the horse's ample rump and dock tail, because Crawhall always had a sense of humour. Despite the mundanity of the scene, the composition is innately decorative. The background simplified into a stylized flat pattern. The peacock feather that you can maybe just make out in the boy's cap, a definite nod towards the art for art's sake of Whistler and aestheticism. Next slide, please. However, Crawhall was different to the other Glasgow boys in focusing largely on animals rather than figure studies and portraits, which others of the group had found lucrative. Also, in contrast to them, he worked largely in watercolour, which was considered a lesser medium than oil at the time. And in this, he was like Arthur Melville, who'd actually been the one to encourage him to turn to watercolour while they were in Coburn's path in 1883 to 85. This work here, an Arab raid, painted in Tangier, Morocco, around 1888. And um, it's very close to Melville's watercolours of Spain and North Africa from the 1890s, with its bold diagonal format and deep blue of the river contrasting provocatively with areas of empty space and bare paper. Crawhall visited um, Tangier regularly from 1882 until the mid 1890s, um, sometimes wintering there um, for up to six months at a time. Next slide, please. 
He was attracted by the low cost of living and also the availability of horses. According to his friend, the politician and adventurer, Robert Bontine Cunningham Graham, no place could have suited him better than the Tangier of those days. In it, he found exactly what he wanted for his art. Horses could be bought cheaply and kept for under a shilling a day. And Crawhall acquired an old gelding, Dan Dancer, a cross between a North African barb and a Spanish mare, who'd apparently once pulled a cab in Gibraltar and had great stamina, and Crawhall won many a race on his back. Crawhall fitted in very well with the group of elite Europeans in Tangier at that time. They liked their sporting and social activities, and Crawhall took part in their makeshift polo matches, horse races, gymkhanas, and athletic meets. He joined the Tangier Hunt with its mongrel hounds, where he was first whipped to the charismatic Spanish nobleman, Don Bernardino Fernandez de Velasco, um, who was the 16th Duke of Frias. And his circle also included um, Glasgow boys, John Lavery, and from time to time, Melville, and also William Kennedy, and also Scottish sporting artist, George Denham Armour. Armour wrote that Crawhall, and this is where I get my title from, Crawhall was a beautiful natural horseman and in Tangier was our champion jockey. Crawhall also, um, perhaps a bit distastefully, um, took part in um, amateur bullfights and also pig sticking, which was wild boar hunting. Um, the latter was typical of the cultural insensitivity of Europeans at the time in this predominantly Muslim country. And several of Crawhall's sketches unfortunately reflect the prevailing imperialist and racist attitudes of the British in Africa at the time. Um, next slide, please. From Tangier, Crawhall and Armour found that they could easily travel to Spain, taking a paddle steamer to Gibraltar and then on to Andalusia. Um, and there it wasn't the hispano moresque architecture, the dramatic sierras, colourful fiestas or seductive flamenco that attracted their attention, but the gory spectacle of the bullfight, as in this work, um, Bullfight at Algeciras. Despite expressing revulsion at the suffering of horses within bullfights, Crawhall here chose to depict the moment when the picador's mount is lifted off the ground by the bull. And it's unclear if the horse's unprotected belly is being gored, but its anguish is apparent as it lunges and kicks out. A masterpiece of atmosphere and emotion, Crawhall conveys the tension and passion of the bullfight, as though the viewer were experiencing the life and death struggle between horse, picador and bull firsthand. The Scottish Art Review described the work as almost too painfully realistic. Next slide, please. Now, Crawhall's friendship with Armour continued back home in England, and together, around 1896 to 98, they ran a stud farm in Wheat, Wheat Hampstead mm -hmm. in Hertfordshire. Um, Armour recalled, our experience of horse buying in Morocco still influenced our ideas of price, and we really had some wonderful bargains. They also used to enter flapper meetings, that is unlicensed pony racing competitions, covering their expenses through small wins. And Crawhall rode a small but spirited barb stallion called Mesmuda, which he had imported from Tangier. And this portrait here by Armour shows Crawhall in his racing colours. Next slide, please. This work, The Hunt, may date from Crawhall's time running a stud with armour in Hertfordshire. Um, but Crawhall's hunting scenes were not about recording specific events. Similarly, his animal studies were never portraits. He wasn't interested in commissions to paint specific prize-bred animals or beloved mounts, although such portraits would no doubt have been lucrative. For Crawhall, design considerations were always paramount. paramount. And here, the red of the huntsman's coats is perfectly balanced against the gold and lilac tones of the dun horse in near profile and the stylized agricultural landscape beyond. The alert poise of the horse's ears, the flare of its nostrils and the way it holds the bit of the bridle in its mouth shows Crawhall's innate understanding and experience of horses over many years distilled into this image. 
and the result is fluid and bold like poster design with which many artists were experimenting in the 1890s. Next slide please. The race here is another poster-like design. The composition is quite radical in its foreshortening. Showing the horse from behind, Crawhall draws attention to his powerful hindquarters. The unusual vantage point gives a sense of thrill and excitement as the viewer becomes a rider in the race. But it's the dynamic depiction of the whip that is so innovative painted to give a sense of passage through time and space. Cunningham Graham marveled at Crawhall's art, which he wrote was so attuned to modern vision. And indeed here, Crawhall radically prefigures the concerns of the Italian futurists by some 20 years. The Italian futurists were a pioneering cubist group that were all about speed, dynamism, technology in the city. Next slide, please. And one of its protagonists, Giacomo Bala, and his um, dynamism of a dog on a leash, which you can see here, famously painted the dog's legs, lead and owner's feet multiple times to indicate movement. And so Crawhall duplicated the jockey's whip again and again to show its progress through the air. Next slide, please. As I said, Crawhall often attended race meets. Another dynamic image is this one here, Todd Sloan, American jockey from around 1899, um, focusing on the celebrity American jockey, James Foreman, Todd Sloan, who revolutionized British horse racing from 1897 with his unique riding style, crouch, crouching in the saddle with short reins and stirrups, which all jockeys after him then adopted. Um, if we can just see the next slide, you see a, a, um, a, a kind of caricature of him in Vanity Fair of the day, um, so this would have looked absolutely extraordinary to um, viewers of the day. Um, next slide, please. Crawhall shows Todd Sloan, the one before. Yeah, that one, thank you. Um, Crawhall shows Todd Sloan um, about to jump, um, racehorse and jockey, jockey preparing to jump here. And um, movement suggested through a slight blur or after image as in photography. Next slide. From the 1870s, there have been experiments with chrono photography, most famously um, by pioneer British photographer Edward Maybridge, who captured galloping horses in successive frames, predating actual moving film. And Crawhall, who was one of the first artists to accurately depict a horse in motion, would have been aware of such experimental photography, and particularly as it was also used to record racehorses. Um, next slide. I've, I've just included here a herring print, just so you can get an idea of the way that um, artists previously depicted horses galloping, as I mentioned in that kind of hobby horse fashion. Next slide, please. Now, this is a work by Crawhall Sr. Crawhall's work works are notable for their lively wit, a trait which he inherited from his father, who regularly supplied the illustrator illustrator Charles Keane with comic drawings for publication in the satirical magazine Punch, and this is one of them. Um, so Crawhall Jr. was on a very similar wavelength to his father, and many of his comic sketches um, leave you to imagine what's going to happen next, as you can see his father doing in this work um, um, called Caution the Bull. And you can see the he wasn't such a good artist as his son, and so he wrote, this is a bull, <laughs> just to let you know, that is meant to be a bull. But um, when he sent his drawings to um, Charles Keane, Charles Keane would work them up into more sophisticated drawings that would then get published in Punch. Next slide, please. So you can see Crawhall doing a very similar thing in this work, Racehorses and Jockeys. In it, he contrasts the alert, the alert ears, long neck, fine limbs and elegant posture of the noble racehorse with the squat figure of the jockey made comic in his red cap with his exaggerated peak, oversized whip, flared white jodhpurs and tiny legs. More bestial than the horse, he absentmindedly scratches himself. The racehorse's hood, commonly used for highly strung animals, portents danger, bringing to mind the anonymity of the executioner. 
Crowhall's pictorial wit often revolved around such comic pairings of people and animals, and usually the people come off worse. Whether light-hearted light comic sketches like this one, innovative compositions like the race, which we saw, or decorative designs like the hunt, Crawhall was a master when it came to depicting horses. In 1922, Thomas Campbell Mackey, who was head of design at Glasgow School of Art, observed admiringly of Crawhall's talents and very aptly taken an, a racing analogy. He was both physically and artistically a lightweight but never jockey of that sort ro rode more surely to victory. And referring to Crawhall as a lightweight, I think there he's referring to Crawhall using watercolours, again that kind of stigma about watercolours not being as good as, as oil painting. Next slide please. Now Glasgow shipowner and collector Sir William Burrell began to collect Crawhall's paintings and drawings in the mid 1880s after seeing his work exhibited along with those of the other Glasgow boys in the Glasgow Institute of the Fine Arts exhibitions and also in the exhibitions of the Scottish Society of Painters in Watercolour. From May 1911 he recorded his acquisitions, next slide please, in purchase books like this one and with dates, descriptions and prices listed, which as you can imagine is incredibly useful to the curator and art historian. And, he, and, and Burrell bought many of his crawls after this date, but it's hard to know exactly when many of his earlier acquisitions were made. We just wish that he'd started these purchase books a bit earlier. But we do know, next slide, um, that Burrell bought this work, The White Horse, which shows a, um, a barb stallion at a stable manger, um, for 12 guineas from an exhibition of the Scottish Society of Painters and Watercolour in Glasgow in 1886. And it may well have been Burrell's first Crawhall purchase. Encouraged by Glasgow art dealer Alexander Reid, Burrell developed an obsession for Crawhall's work. According to Campbell Mackey again, writing in the Studio magazine in 1922, and I quote, if you were to offer Mr. Burrell a Duga, a Monticelli or a Matthew Maris, he would probably ponder long before deciding to purchase. He would have it set home for a few days, examined in different lights, perhaps even hung on his walls and seriously discussed and considered. And then he would come to a decision for or against. But if you offered him a crawhole, he would succumb at once. Now, Burrell's brother George was also a collector. And what was it about Crawhall that attracted them to him? Next slide, please. Well, Crawhall's equine watercolours and drawings portrayed a world that the Burrells understood and to which they related. As with many in their social set, the Burrells hunted and attended the races. The Eglinton Hunt met at Purston House, the Ayrshire home of Burrell's sister, Mary Mitchell. Gordon Burrell, um, Burrell's nephew, and his wife Brenda owned thoroughbreds which competed at air and muscle gra race courses. At Hutton Castle in Berwickshire, um, Burrell himself rode and hunted, and he rented Mayshield Estate in the Lammermuirs for grouse hunting. And that's what you can see in this particular photograph here from 1936. And many of Crawhall's relationships actually were based around a shared love of horses, whether um, dealer Alexander Reed, with whom he used to ride in Glasgow, friends like Lavery or Cunningham Graham, with whom he rode and hunted in Tangier, or wealthy patrons like William Burrell. Now, Burrell was an eclectic collector. He collected historic furniture, architectural fragments, tapestries, stained glass, arms and armour, Chinese porcelain, Islamic ceramics and textiles, artefacts from ancient civilizations, and 17th to 20th century European painting, sculpture, pastels, watercolours, drawings, and prints. Next slide, please. However, his single-minded collecting of Crawhall artworks was unique. And it's about 150 artworks by Crawhall in the Burrell collection, more than by any other single artist. His Crawhall collecting spanned more than 60 years varied in subject matter, style, medium and date, and I show a sample here. The works Burrell purchased give a comprehensive picture of Crawhall's talents and development as an artist, making it an invaluable collection for the study and understanding of the artist's practice. It's the largest and most significant collection of Crawhall artworks in the world. 
and I'll end there because time's getting on. But just to say, just to reiterate, Tim, in saying that the borough collection reopens on the 29th of March, and I do hope that you will all come and pay us a visit, um, and you will see some of our crawls on display. And as, as Tim said as well, there'll be a new book, which is at the publishers as we speak, and I hope will be on the shelves of the gift shop when the borough reopens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jo. Um, a fantastic talk about an undervalued, I think, artist in the wider sporting world. Uh, you've kindly said you'll answer questions. Um, and you also said that if you didn't know the answer, you'd say you didn't know. Um, can I start by asking about the influences on Craw Hall? Um, you mentioned his father, but was he part of a, a wider uh, school, do you think? Yeah, um, definitely his father was the biggest influence on him. And importantly, it was his father who really instilled from when he was you know, a child that he should um, learn to draw from memory rather than painting in front of an object. And that was such sage advice and meant that we have these wonderful um, distilled um, um, images which just capture the essence of, of animals and birds. But um, as I said, he fitted in with the Glasgow boy painters or maybe didn't fit in. He was a bit of an oddity. He was a bit on the periphery of the Glasgow boys group. He wasn't Scottish, um, but he did share with them many influences. I, I mentioned a few of them. I mentioned Whistler, I mentioned Japanese prints. And you can see in Crawhall's works, you know, the high horizon line that he offers and adopts and the unusual angles and the linearity of his works, the almost calligraphic approach to some of his works, which I think were definitely um, it would definitely derive from um, Japanese prints and even um, some Chinese silk drawings. And the fact that he chose to at times work on linen as well, I wonder whether that he was influenced in that by Chinese silk drawings. Um, he was also influenced by, as I said, some French art, particularly the naturalist painter Bastien Lepage and the Hague School. So some of his earlier works, which are very um, um, almost monochromatic, um, and soft, and there's a beautiful one of a greyhound in the Borough Collection. You can very much see the influence of the Hague School there, which was sometimes unkindly called the Grey School. Um, but most of, I mean, Crawhall's works are generally known for being very bold and colourful and decorative, and that is why our public um, enjoy coming to see them so much. Can I, uh, if anybody's got questions for Joe, all you have to do is to type them in, uh, press the button Q&A in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Uh, I will see the questions and put them to, to Joe. Um, I thought I see, I'm not an expert in these things, but thought I saw Crawhall's influence on other artists that came after him. Uh, Bevan came to mind, um, and, and perhaps Munnings as well in uh, some of the early Munnings work. Do you, do you think he did have that influence or was he hidden away? Um, I'm not an expert on um, sporting art in general, but certainly Crawhall's artwork did strike a new path that was then, I think, um, admired and um, inspired other artists because it was so different from what other um, animal artists were doing at the time. I mean, you think about, well, Moreau, who I showed, or Landseer's animal paintings, which were kind of typical Victorian fair, a bit sentimental and romanticised. And um, Crawhall, with his, his very um, quick looking sketches, very dynamic, um, where he wasn't really wanting to detail um, form, but really just suggest form. They were, they were very innovative at the time and certainly inspirational to other artists. Uh, what do you think attracted Crawhall to North Africa? Um, obviously they're there quite frequently and with fellow artists. Yeah, Was it yeah. more than just a painting trip? Well, I think like many artists of his time, he would have been attracted to North Africa because of the difference in culture and the excitement of traveling off the beaten track a bit. But at the same time, Tangier was pretty easy to get to. So it was one of those places where you could experience 
the exoticism, if you like, without having to go too far. Um, and many artists like him were attracted to Tangier for that reason. But I think Kroho was attracted um, because of um, his love of horses and the fact that he could get horses cheaply in Morocco um, and he could board them cheaply so he could stay long periods of time and it wouldn't cost him much money. And as I said, he fitted in well with the kind of sporting set um, in Tangier. He also suffered from lung problems throughout his life. And when he died um, at a very early age in 1913, um, this was really from problems exacerbated by his lung problems. And, and I think that when he started going to Tangier in the 1880s, probably the temperate climate was an attraction for him. Um, there has been speculation about whether Crawhall was gay. He, he never married. He didn't have many female friends and he preferred the company of his um, his family um, and it may have been like other artists that you know Tangier offered somewhere where he could go and be off the radar a bit because of course homosexuality was um, illegal at the time and he didn't want to face um, 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 criticism or worse and so Tangier might have been a place where he, he, he could um, you know carry on a lifestyle that wouldn't have been approved of at home and there certainly were male prostitutes in the brothels in Tangier but that's speculation. I'm not sure we'll go into that in great depth. Um, um, you're going to open or reopen on March 29th. Uh, how many craw halls will be on display? Okay, well, our visitors are always saying, where are all the craw halls? Because I think people would love them all to be on display all the time. And unfortunately that can't happen because their work's on paper and they're very vulnerable to light damage. Um, and in fact, we have seen some slight fading in the works over a year, over the years, and we really have to protect them for posterity. And so with the borough reopening, we have got a rotation planned where we will show um, a, a handful of crawls at a time, but we will regularly rotate them and rest the works that have been on display for the re prerequisite amount of time as uh, um, recommended by our conservators. So when the borough reopens, there'll be four crawls on display. There'll be two in a gallery which looks at um, Burrell's contemporary collecting, so his friendship with the Glasgow boys and his buying of um, other quite um, modern French works, because often he's, he's thought of as an antiquarian. So this is a room where we get to look at the Burrell the modern man, so it's quite an exciting space. And there's also going to be two of Crowell's artworks, his illustrations to his Renard the Fox series um, in a storytelling gallery, which is meant for families and there's going to be various um, objects and artworks on display that will encourage storytelling. I believe uh, you've mentioned conservation and protection of the works on paper. I think some are on linen as well, aren't they? Uh, they does are. that have more problems for conservation? Um, no, do you know, I think paper is the worst because paper um, yellows um, quite badly in light and then the, the watercolour pigment fades. So Crawhall's works on linen tend to be more body colour because it could hold its own on the linen. And this is actually less vulnerable than the watercolour pigments. So that they're both they're both vulnerable, but um, I wouldn't say that the linen was more vulnerable, um, probably slightly less. But I should also say that um, all of our Crawhall artworks, we've got about 150 in the collection. They are all online in our um, online collection pages. So um, with illustrations, so you can see them online. I know it's not the same, but at least you can see the variety of our collection and you can make appointments to come and view any you like, because the beauty of the new borough is that we're gonna have a, a so-called open store so it's not going to be open like the galleries, but you can come and make an appointment to view things. There'll be tours around the stores, things like that. So um, we can certainly get craw halls out if you happen to come to Glasgow and want to make an appointment, given us plenty of notice, of course, um, we can get craw halls out for you. And of course, it's the new book as well. Well, that'd be fantastic if we can organise our trip to Scotland, um, both to Edinburgh and uh, Glasgow. It looks as though there's a behind the scenes tour that would be of great interest to us. Uh, and members. Happy, yes, I could, I could definitely facilitate that for you. <laughs> you don't know what you've promised. <laughs> <laughs> um, why do you think Crawl Hall is not better known? 
Um, that's a good question. I think partly it's his own fault because he was such a perfectionist that he destroyed a lot of his work. And in fact, one of his most popular works that I showed in the last slide, The Aviary, um, it was actually rescued by um, um, a dealer, um, William Bell Patterson from the bin where Crawl had, had, had to sent it. So um, he, he destroyed a lot of things that he wasn't happy with. So there wasn't a lot on the market for people to buy. And the other problem was Burrell because Burrell was so obsessed with Crawl's work that he would snatch up things as soon as they came on the market, stopping other collectors from buying things. And certainly there was a certain amount of frustration that people couldn't buy Crawhalls. And I mean, it's brilliant for us that we've got such a, a large collection of Crawhall works in Glasgow, but it does mean that um, there are less Crawhalls in other collections. So he isn't as well known. In Glasgow, he's very well known, but outside less so. It sounds as though you, the, the new book should be promoted more widely. So he does get a, a better uh, sense of recognition. So, um, Sally, is, uh, I think we'll provide a link um, to these talks to uh, the links on your website so that uh, it'll be easy for, easy for everybody to get to see more of the Craw Hall works, which will be fantastic. Great. Um, you've spent a lot of time with us, uh, Joe. I'd like to thank you for the time that you've spent. Uh, I think you've given us a better appreciation of all the work that Craw Hall was doing uh, and the range of material and his potential influence on other artists uh, coming into the 20th century. Uh, it's much appreciated. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And on behalf of everybody, I'd like to thank you uh, for the talk this morning. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.